looking at something which can... 16 past paper, multiple choice question one. An experiment was set up to measure the activity of an enzyme using a substrate that produced a coloured product. The absorbance of the coloured product was measured using a colorimeter. Which row in the table describes the variable that is being measured? Okay, so we're looking at colour. Okay. And we are looking across a range. That's important. Okay. So if we are looking at something which can be measured with a number, which we are because we've got a colorimeter here, uh, then we are looking at a quantitative set of data. So quantitative, quantitative, so it's not A or C. And we are looking at something which follows a range, so that makes it continuous. D. Question three. Diagram below represents a transmembrane protein. Some of the amino acids in the protein have been identified. So we have, this is your intracellular side, and here's our extracellular, and we've got a protein which is kind of weaving its way back and forward across it. What you're supposed to recognise is these bits here, and indeed to this side, okay? So these are all going to be hydrophilic. Anything which is in that section is going to like being near the dipoles that you find in water. However, this section in here... That's your phospho sorry, yes, your phospholipid section in the middle um, of the bilayer. So this bit in here is hydrophobic. So looking at the amino acids, we are looking for something which is in the middle being hydrophobic. So leucine and leucine in here, okay, definitely hydrophobic. Polar would put it to be hydrophilic, so that's not true. Um, and then we've got serine on the outside edge, which definitely likes to be near water, so polar. Polar. Um, and then we've got arginine, which is here, and alanine, which is here. So the same logic goes. Arginine is on the outside, so it is polar, and alanine is on the inside, so it is hydrophobic. Hence why it's A. Question 4. During muscle contraction, the protein myosin moves along an actin protein filament by the head of the myosin detaching from the actin, swinging forward and rebinding as shown. So we've got our little picture of this kind of clicking forward. Uh, you've got a, a, a size here of 36 nanometers. You're told that one nanometer is 10 to the minus nine meters. This reversible conformational change can be brought about by binding of ATP to the myosin head followed by hydrolysis and release of phosphate and ADP. The myosin head is acting as. Okay, so what we're looking for is what exactly is it doing? Okay, so it says it's binding of ATP to the myosin head followed by hydrolysis and release of the phosphate and ADP. So what that is doing is breaking up ATP, so therefore it's an ATPase. It's not a kinase, a kinase moves a group from somewhere to somewhere else. Um, it's not a proteinase because it's not breaking down a protein, and it's not a phosphatase because it is not um, removing the phosphate from somewhere. Okay. Same data that was in for question four. Um, we're looking now, when the myosin head detaches and swings forward, it moves a distance of 36 nanometers. Myosin has been observed to move at a speed of 18 times 10 to the three nanometers per second. How many times will the myosin head detach and swing forward in one second? So we have 18 times 10 to the three, which is a little bit dodgy in terms of scientific notation, but okay. And each one um, is 36 for each distance. So how many times it happens, you're just doing that. So plug it in your calculator, 500, okay? Okay, question six. In animal rod cells, rhodopsin absorbs a photon of light initiating the following cell events, and we're looking for order. Okay, so we've got a nerve impulse generated, sufficient product formation is triggered, activation of hundreds of G protein molecules, activation of hundreds of molecules of an enzyme. Okay, so there's lots of ways you can do this. I personally, in this one, think it's reasonable to start with the end. Okay, the whole point of the rhodopsin finally triggering what's going on is to send an electrical impulse to your brain to tell you that something has happened. Okay, so the last thing that we need is for one. So that gets me rid of two things to start off with. Um, it also tells me what the starting event must be, because it's telling me 3421 is an option, or 3241. Okay, so our first thing that happens, we have here. 
activation of hundreds of G-protein molecules. And then we're looking for what is the next logical thing? Should it be activation of hundreds of molecules of an enzyme followed by sufficient product formation? Or should it be activation of 100 G protein molecules gives us sufficient product formation and then activation of mo molecules of an enzyme? The only one that makes sense is that after you've got your G proteins, that then activates the enzyme, which then activates sufficient product, which then activates our electrical impulse. Okay. Obviously, this is also something you should just know as a pathway. So, um, but I like the fact that you could almost do it totally just by logic. Okay. Okay. In multicellular organisms, only target cells respond to a specific signal because you could argue that this is actually Nat five when you're talking about um, hormones and where they go from endocrine glands. Basically, you are looking at target cells have to have the receptor for the signal. If they don't have the receptor for the signal, then nothing works. So it's this, and that's it. The rest of them don't make any sense. Signaling molecules only come into contact with target cells is completely a lie because it's going they're going everywhere. Non-target cells do not respond when the signaling molecule binds to its receptor. That wouldn't make any sense. Okay, the receptor has to then do something. Receptor molecules in non-target cells do not change conformation when the signal molecule binds. Again, that would defeat the point of a receptor molecule. So it has to be B. Okay, this one looks horrible, but to be honest, it's just plugging numbers into your calculator. Biological molecules move over short distances by diffusion. Time taken for diffusion can be calculated using the equation below. So we have the time is equal to the distance traveled squared divided by two times the diffusion coefficient. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter with a diffusion coefficient of four times 10 to the minus six. And the gap across the synapse is 5 times 10 to the minus 6. How many seconds would it take to cross the synapse? Time is equal to, okay, so we're looking for x squared being the, let's get this right, we're now tra distance travelled. So our distance travel is 5 times 10 to the minus 6 squared, okay, divided by 2d, so 2 times the diffusion coefficient, so 2 times... 4 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay, plug all that in. Uh, 3.125 times 10 to the minus 6. And there's your answer. Question 10. Type 1 diabetes is caused by... It's again a little bit gifty in a lot of ways. Um, I would expect you to remember even from that 5 that type 1 is to do with insulin production, or rather the lack of insulin production, and type 2 is to do with insulin resistance. So this, so type 2 means you're making the insulin but you're refusing to respond to it, and type 1 means that you cannot make enough of the insulin. This is type 1, that's it. An enzyme-controlled reaction is taking place in optimum conditions in the presence of a large sub surplus of substrates. We've got excess substrate, that's probably going to be important. Conditions can be altered by, so we've got one, increasing the temperature, two, adding a positive modulator, three, increasing enzyme concentration, four, increasing substrate concentration. Product yield would be increased by, okay, so we're trying to increase, oh, sorry, uh, substrate to product, and we have various things that we could do to the enzyme to make that happen. Okay, right. So for a start, it tells you there's a large substrate of large surplus, sorry, of substrate. So if I've got excess substrate already, increasing substrate concentration here is not going to make any difference whatsoever. So it's definitely not four, which gets me rid of C and D, which is quite nice. Okay, so our options are one and two or two and three. So I know that 2 is absolutely correct, and definitely is. Adding a positive modulator, so this would increase my enzyme function. So that would that would work, okay? And our next options are either increasing the temperature or increasing enzyme concentration. But you have to be very careful. It says here, in optimum conditions. So it's already at its perfect temperature as far as it's concerned. So temperature curve, remember the graph. Okay, so it's already up here. So if I increase the temperature any further, I'm going to start destroying function because I'm basically going to start denaturing my enzyme. 
even if it doesn't go quite as far as denaturing it, it's certainly going to muck it up a little bit. It's going to take it past the optimum. So overall, uh, we are looking for not that, 2 and 3, so B. Question 12. At which phase of the cell cycle is the retinoblastoma protein phosphorylated, allowing progression to the next phase of the cycle? I'm afraid you just need to know this one. Okay, retinoblastoma is... Retinoblastoma. I keep on saying the same thing. Retinoblastoma blastoma okay so rb is linked to the g1 checkpoint okay it is you have to get past a certain point of um rb being phosphorylated for you to trigger and get past the g1 so that's it Given what you just did in 12 this is actually there's a little bit of extra help here the diagram below shows possible outcomes for a cell following dna damage protein x is involved in all three outcomes protein x is Okay, so we've just said that RB, retinoblastoma, blastoma, cannot see it, sorry, RB, okay, is involved in cell cycle. Okay, it's involved in cell cycle. So it's not involved in DNA repair and apoptosis, so get rid of that. Okay, you may just recognise the next one, P53, it is involved in everything. Okay, it's a tumour suppressor gene um, that is just involved in so many different things. CDKs, cyclin dependent kinases, okay, they are part of cell cycle stuff as well, but not necessarily the rest of them, so not that. And caspases, they are involved in apoptosis, so programmed cell death. So P53, correct answer. Okay, question 14. Two reagents used in testing for the presence of carbohydrates are iodine solution, which turns blue-black in the presence of starch, and Benedict solution, which turns bright red in the presence of maltose. In an investigation of the breakdown of starch into maltose by the enzyme amylase, which of the following would be a positive control? Okay, so starch, amylase, maltose, one of the first enzyme reactions you would have looked at, okay, ever in science, I would say, but definitely biology. Um, so we are looking for a positive control, so I'm looking for something that will show up what I'm expecting to see if I had a positive result. So I'm looking for a test for maltose. So A works rather nicely with that one. Okay, B is saying is not to do with a positive control, because we're basically saying um, that starch treated with amylase turns Benedict solution brick red. That's really the experiment. Starch alone tested with Benedict remains blue is not testing the expected result it's the not result really um, and starch treated with amylase does not change the color of iodine solution again is not testing for the production of maltose it's testing for something else okay